Good morning, church. I still can't decide if I should wear a suit on Sunday or not. Today, I'm going to take you to John chapter 12, just the first eight verses. John 12 is the chapter immediately following Lazarus's resurrection. And it begins here in verse 1. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now you just got to picture this scene. Here Jesus is having a meal, and he's sitting there with some close friends with his disciples, and Mary and Martha are throwing this party in his honor, which of course you would because their brother is now alive again. Anyway, there's this dinner that's happening and Mary comes in and takes a pint. Now, you have to realize what a pint is. A pint is 16 ounces, is two cups. Just imagine Two whole cups, 16 ounces, we're talking more than a can of soda, filled with expensive perfume being poured out all over a person and then eventually the ground. That would be one strong smelling room. It would ruin the whole meal. I mean, the entire meal from that point on would taste and smell like whatever nard smells like. And so as a result, the room dinner experience would have been pretty much ruined. But you gotta see what happens next. Verse four, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. See, at that point in time, we get a little bit of Judas's uh, behind-the-scenes motivations. He was in this Jesus thing kind of for his own personal benefit. Now, I could talk a lot today about the people who are followers of Jesus for their own personal benefit. I don't have time to get into that today. What I want to focus on is the simple fact that he declares the value of the perfume. He says it was worth a year's wages. You know what that means? That means Mary's perfume was worth around 40 maybe $45,000. The average household income for people in my home county, Tippecanoe County, Indiana, is around $45,000. And so if this perfume is worth a year's wages, then it's worth, for our money today, about $45,000. My question to you is if you had a jar of perfume worth $45,000, what would you do with that perfume? Would you sell it? Would you use that money? Would you, would you buy a new house, buy a new car? Would you save it for retirement? What would you do? Would you bring it to church and pour it on the ground? This is the remarkable thing. From everybody's perspective, this is an incredible waste. Jesus says, verse 7, Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. There are a few things Jesus says there in that line that really intrigue me. One, he says it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Well, whose intent? Was it Jesus' intent? Was it Mary's intent? Was it heaven, the Heavenly Father's intent? intent? Whose intent was that this perfume should be saved for the day of his burial? And it's not the day of his burial yet, and so therefore this perfume hasn't met its intended purpose. Unless what Jesus is saying is that Mary, more than anyone else, understood that when Jesus said he was going to die, he was going to die. Mary, perhaps the only person who heard Jesus say, 
I'm going to be killed and believed that he was actually going to be killed. Maybe Mary had originally been saving up this perfume as a life savings. Maybe Mary had originally just been saving up a life savings. And when she heard that Jesus was going to be killed, she went out and bought some perfume to use for his burial and then realized that it was no good to anoint Jesus after he was dead. She wanted him to know how much she loved him. Maybe it was after Lazarus was raised from the dead, Mary went out and in utter gratitude for what Jesus had done for her brother and for her, she went out and bought the perfume then. I don't know, but Jesus somehow knows that this perfume had original intent and it was for his burial day. But somehow that original intent Intent got changed, and Mary decided she wanted to do it now. And then Jesus tacks on this extra little line at the end. He says, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. What's interesting is that he could have accused Judas right then and there of being a thief. He could have accused Judas right then and there of being double-minded and deceitful. But instead, he just simply says, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Here's my thinking. From everyone's perspective, what Mary did is exuberantly extravagant and wasteful. From Jesus' perspective, it's precious. From Jesus' perspective, it's one of the few moments in the history of the world that a person will be able to share their total love for Jesus in this dramatically personal, direct way. And he's accepting it. He receives it. In fact, where we would say our financial resources should primarily be used for helping the poor, Jesus says there are moments when extravagance can be expressed in just simple, utter worship. Jesus says, I'm here now, and so this worship to me is proper. I just want to highlight for you one obvious truth. Worship is always extravagant. Sure, there are many things that we would consider worship. Sometimes people come to church on a Sunday morning, and, or at least not now, but you know, before the coronavirus thing, people would come to church on a Sunday morning, and they would employ what I would call attaboy worship. That's the kind of worship where you just simply say, Jesus, you know what? It's not a half bad job you did there. Jesus, attaboy, good job, Jesus. I, mean, I really kind of like you. I, I think you've, you've done some good things, and, I, and I'm proud of you. Good job, Jesus. That's attaboy worship. There are other people who uh, express what I would call duty worship, the kind of worship where they just feel obligated to do it. So they show up at church. They're there at church because they're obligated. And so they're out there in the congregation and they're just singing as much as they need to sing and participating as much as they need to participate in order for themselves to feel like they did their own good job. It's the I've done a good job, pat myself on the back kind of worship. I've come to worship God because it's my responsibility to do so. And so then the question is, how much do I have to do so that I feel good about myself? That's the person who will say every single word in every single song exactly the way it's written on the screen. And they'll just make sure they get it. If the, if the band leader says, okay, clap your hands, sure, they'll clap their hands for a few measures and then kind of let it die. If uh, something happens in the worship gathering that's funny and other people are laughing, they'll laugh along with it. But basically, they're just there to sort of pay their dues and pat themselves on the back. But then there are other people. There are other people who show up at church and they're there completely and entirely for Jesus himself. And they're like, Jesus, I've come here because this is a place where other people are worshiping you and I'm going to let loose. I'm just going to honor you. These are the people that I would call raving fans, worshipers. 
These are the people who, uh, in our modern society, they would be the, the Tom Brady supporters. You know, if someone's a Tom Brady supporter, you can't get away from them talking about how good Tom Brady is. And you're sick of it. And you're, you're just absolutely, it, it's the worst thing in the world for you to hear from this person. And you know they're going to talk about it again. And so you try to avoid them. But listen, people who worship Jesus as raving fan worshipers, are kind of like that. There are some people in their life who just simply say, don't talk about Jesus anymore. But Mary was a raving fan worshiper. And Jesus says, you will always have the practical things. You will always have the strategic things, but you will not always have me. See, what Jesus is saying is, yeah, there's all kinds of things you can do with your time, your energy, your resources. But there's one thing that will always be honored by him. And that's when you bring your worship directly to him. Listen, this Sunday, you're not coming to church. This Sunday, you're gonna be stuck in your homes like we have been doing for the past few Sundays. And you're gonna be experiencing a worship experience kind of thing from there. But I just gotta let you know, worship isn't about performing a task like showing up at church or turning on your television screen. And worship isn't about just simply saying, you know what, Jesus, you did a really good job this week. I'll, I'll give you some props for that. I'll, I'll rate you a four, maybe a five. I want to invite you to be raving fan worshipers. Listen, you just look at your family members and you say, today, I'm pouring out a bucket of perfume. And I don't care what you think of me because I'm just going to spend some time here telling Jesus how great I think he is. Because worship is always extravagant. And maybe today, from the comfort of your own home, with your television on, watching streaming worship, maybe, maybe this Sunday is the day that you would say, you know what? I don't care what people think, and I don't care that I'm not in the environment. I'm going to be a raving fan. Take whatever you got. Everything you got extravagantly pour it out at Jesus' feet. Because listen, there's no way you and I can possibly measure up to what Mary did financially in her worship. So why not just measure up with what she did with our attitudes? I encourage you to be an extravagant worshiper, a raving fan, even this Sunday, from the comfort of your own couch. Let me pray for you. God, I pray that you would help us to shed the qualms and to get rid of the nervousness that we often face when it comes to worshiping you. And Lord, this Sunday, in the privacy of our homes, would you help us to be extravagant worshipers, however weird or odd it feels, because you are with us by your Holy Spirit. You are always with us now. And though Jesus said at a time long ago, you will not always have me, we know today that we do have you, always by the presence of your Spirit in our lives and in our homes. Lord God, would you move in our hearts this weekend and make us even more of a family of worship to you. Lord, thanks for giving us this time together this morning and for all the things you're doing in our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Train yourself to be an extravagant worshiper as you prepare for Sunday's time together.